Chapter 7 of Dog Watches at Sea This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dog Watches at Sea by Stanton H. King Chapter 7 Fishing for Sharks At last our hold was filled, the seams of the hatches cocked, the tarpaulins hauled over, and securely battened down. Only a few more lighters of logwood to be stowed on deck, and we would be ready for sea. It was a great relief to know we were drawing near the day when we should steer our course to another port. The only break in the monotony of work and sleep was the recreation of sailing around the bay on Sunday afternoons. The captain gave us the use of the ship's boat to go where we pleased. He knew there was no danger, as he had stubbornly refused to advance a cent to anyone on board. Although the old mate had no money, after spending his eight shillings, he still found means of having a supply of liquor on hand. No one knew how we did it until we were some days at sea when we discovered that he hadn't a change of clothing. The lighterman in Aquin had taken his clothes in exchange for liquor. Every man forward had shared his rum, and all, therefore, willingly allowed him to use their clothes. Our water supply had to be replenished. The two large iron tanks, secured to the deck, were empty, and as I was the smallest person on board, it was my lot to go, feet first, through the manholes in the top of the tanks, and clean them out. With an old corn broom, I stirred up the rusty water from the bottom, and sluiced and scrubbed vigorously to get the thick coating of rust off the sides. Then, bailing out the dirty water, I gave the tanks a liberal coat of whitewash. This took all my strength. I had just finished the second tank, when, feeling that I was losing consciousness, I put both hands up through the manhole and begged the mate to haul me out. I could stand it no longer. The hot sun pouring upon the tanks had made them like two heated ovens. Wet through with rusty water in whitewash, I crawled forward under the forecastle head, too sick to do any more work that day. Next morning I was myself again, and at turn to help to get our large clinker-built boat over the side. We were making preparations to water the ship. The midship thwarts were taken out and two large casks lowered into the boat. Frank, Moses, Bill, and I were told to get in and drop down to the gangway. With a jug of water, a can of roast beef which was kept for the cabin's Sunday dinner, and plenty of pintails, we hoisted our mainsail and shoved off, with Mr. Moore on board in search of water. Our captain had told Mr. Moore to keep close to the land or he would miss the small inlet where the spring of water was to be found. Unfortunately, the mate had a bottle of rum, and no sooner were we clear of the ship than he shared it with us. The effect of the liquor was to make each man desirous of singing a song. The old mate finished his ditty, then keeled over and fell asleep in the stern sheets while we kept running on before the breeze. We must have been sailing for fully three hours when we saw a cluster of houses and huts on a projecting part of the coast. We roused the mate from his stupor and steered for the beach. When we were about a quarter of a mile from the village, a boat filled with soldiers armed with rifles rowed off and met us. Jabbering away in their distracting lingo, they ran their boat against ours and, jumping aboard, made us their prisoners. 
At first it seemed a huge joke. The scarecrow uniforms of the soldiers caused Bill's Irish wit to flow freely, and we roared with laughter at the queer remarks he made. But when we were brought before a negro, dressed in an old black suit, a faded, well-worn cocked hat with a band of dirty gold lace on it, and felt the handcuffs on our wrists, we ceased our ribaldry and tried to explain who we were. When we said we were English, they would sneer, shrug their shoulders, and yell, Americano. A guard marched us through the streets to the house of an old black man, who we afterwards learned was a general. He gave orders to his men, who marched us to the Calabozo. It was well for us, it was not the hottest season, or I believe we would never have left this lock-up alive. The miserable hole, a prison for men, was teeming with filth and vermin. It was a mere enclosure of stone walls with no covering to protect us from the heat of the sun or the dew at night. As we reached the door, the soldiers on guard began their jabbering. They slapped their hands, shrugged their shoulders, twisted their bodies, and carried on a full Portuguese argument, while they exultantly examined our clothes and removed our tobacco and knives. In the Calabozo, the irons were removed from our hands, and we were prisoners with about a hundred poor unfortunate blacks. For three nights and two days we lived in this pest hole on cornmeal mush. It was impossible to rest. The incessant tum-tum of a drum and the shouting of the guard would have kept us awake if the place had been most comfortable. On the second morning we were taken to the foot of a hill near the marketplace. Again they called us Americano and standing a number of the black prisoners in a row, the soldiers fired and shot them dead. We felt shaky. It seemed as if our return was next, and we were greatly relieved when they marched us back to the lockup. On the third morning, a wrinkled Mexican came in, walked up to the corner where we were huddled together, and said, Good morning, you English, eh? We gladly told him our story. Then we learned that we were supposed to be the crew of an American filibuster who had been secretly selling arms to the rebels. The republics of Haiti and San Domingo were at war, and this American steamer had been successful in landing arms. They thought that we were the crew of this ship and were seeking a landing place on the coast using our search for water as an excuse. This old Mexican was very friendly. He could speak English enough to make himself understood. He had been a sailor in his younger days, but now was settled about four miles outside this town of St. Louis. That morning he had heard of our plight. He cheered us up and left us, promising to be back soon. Hardly an hour had passed when back he came and told us to follow him, for we were free. We walked with him to the general's house. The old soldier, through our benefactor, told us how sorry he was for causing us so much distress, and asked what he could do for us. We expressed the desire for a bath and some clean clothes. Water was plentiful but clothes were scarce, so he offered us each a dungaree soldier's suit, which we accepted, and throwing our filthy garments on the beach, we enjoyed a splash in the sea. After scrubbing each other with sand, we got into the scarecrow suits of the Haitian soldiers. The old soldier was more than kind. He forced upon us all we could eat, fruits of every kind, and all the liquor we wanted. The sneers and jeers of the soldiers and natives were changed into expressions of kindness. 
we could do as we pleased. Our water casks had been filled by them, plenty of fruit stowed in our boat, and late that night we were able to throw off the debauch of the day and make for our ship. All that night we rowed, relieving each other at the oars, and shortly after daybreak we reached the ship to be the laughing stock of the rest of the crew. Our shipmates had been anxious about us. At first they thought we were on a spree on shore. But when the third day passed, with no tidings of our whereabouts, the captain had decided to make a search for us. We quickly shifted into our own clothes, and after a pot of coffee were ready to help hoist the water casks on board. Not a word of the old mate's drinking and how we came to miss the watering place was ever divulged to the cook or captain. We kept our secret forward where it belonged. For a few days our experience in the calabozo was kept fresh in our minds by the painful itching of the shigos which infested our feet. It seems strange to me that neither Mr. Moore nor the other men knew about them. As soon as I felt the itching, harassing sensation in my toes, I examined them for she goes. Although we had been going barefoot for weeks, and our feet were hard and rough as an alligator's hide, these tropical sand fleas penetrated the flesh and made their nests. I was the doctor, for I had seen the Negroes in Barbados remove these insects from their feet. I once saw a boy thrown in his back by the village constable, while another man removed the host of she from his feet with a sharp penknife. I alone knew it was necessary to make sure of getting out the black flea with the bag of eggs, or next day there would be another installment in the same place. I knew that after extracting the she you must fill the cavity with snuff, a harsh remedy, but a sure cure. Therefore, as doctor, I ground some bits of tobacco to dust, and rubbed it into the sore spots, till my shipmates and I fairly yelled with pain. We needed more water, so the next day Captain Olson hired four natives to row him to the watering place, towing behind him a lighter with three empty water casks. He returned that night with his casks filled, but had to make another trip before we had enough. The day before sailing, the mate told me to get into the boat with Harry and Moses and row the captain to shore. Instead of steering for our usual landing place in the mud, he kept the cross and made a landing in the small bushes on the side of the bay. Harry and Moses went with the old man while I was left to watch the boat. In a little while they hove in sight, leading a cow along. How were they to get that stubborn animal into the boat? She seemed large enough to fill all space. The thwarts were unshipped, the boat turned stern into the bushes, and the forelegs of the cow were placed in the stern sheets. I hauled on the rope round her neck, while the captain and two ordinary seamen pushed behind, and so we made her land with a thump on her belly in the bottom of the boat. The weight of the animal sunk the boat deep into the mud, and to get her afloat we had to dismiss our fear of alligators and wade in up to our waists. Then we shoved and pulled with all our strength, while the captain stood on a stump and shoved with an oar. An inch, then another, and gradually we floated. Now came the time to get the captain into the boat. The two ordinary seamen formed a chair with their hands, and the captain sat between them, putting his arms around their necks. Whether it was intentionally done or not, I cannot say, but 
Moses slipped, and with a splash the old man was buried in mud and water. Oh, how he raged! All four of us, soaking wet, got in, and with some pushing and shoving on the oars, started for the ship. There was no room to row, and no clutch aft for sculling, so we were forced to stand up and paddle. The water was as quiet as a mill pond, and it was not far to the ship. We should have reached there safely, but for a ripple caused by an empty lighter rowing ashore from a French bark. As soon as we reached the ripple, the boat began to rock. The cow got on her feet, stumbled, and fell with a splash into the bay. As soon as she came to the surface, we hauled her head up to the stern of the boat, and shipping the oars, hastily made for the ship. A stout strap was sunk, and the bite hauled up with the boat hook under the cow, the fish tackle lowered over the bow, and hooked on. Then, with a few lively heaves around the capstan, we lifted her dangling in the air, and landed her on deck. I shall not jar the sensibility of my readers by relating the cruel way in which the cow was killed. It is enough to say that penal servitude should be inflicted in any community for such cruelty to a dumb beast, even though it was done in ignorance. Captain Olson did the butchering. He kept everyone busy, some cleaning empty beef barrels, others with coarse salt and water making the pickle. It was, cook, do this, and somebody else do the other thing. I do not remember how many barrels there were, but with the exception of the few pieces for immediate use, the whole cow was pickled and stowed in the lazarette. Our ship was loaded. The logwood piled high on the main hatch and last securely to the ring bolts in the deck. Our sailing day had come. It was Good Friday. The two remaining French vessels and a Spanish brig cockbilled their yards in honor of the day. Their yards and mast formed an X, which was meant to represent the cross. It was a dead calm, not a breath of air was stirring. While we were at breakfast, an officer in a boat, the only one in Aquin, came off to us and requested our captain to cockbill our yards. If there had been any wind, I think we should have had to man the windlass. It was so calm, we tipped our yards and remained at anchor till early the following morning, when we were called to turn to and man the windlass. The cluck and bang of the windlass palls, heave, heave, my hearties from the mate, down our side, lift her out of the mud, and many such expressions from the men and our anchor was lifted to the hawse pipe before a sail was touched. The head sails were run up, and away we headed before the breeze for the open sea. All sail was made, the yards trimmed, and at daylight we were steering to the westward, making a course for the windward passage between Haiti and Cuba. The next morning, Easter Sunday, we were in the passage. I was at the wheel from eight o'clock until ten. I saw the cook come aft with a pan of meat, which he held at arm's length. Strutting along, he reached the cabin door and shouted, Cap'n, this meat has an obnoxious odor, sir. Sure enough, not only that piece, but every bit of the pickled cow had to be thrown over the side. As the first bit struck the water, there was a splash and an upheaval, and it disappeared. In a very few moments, we were surrounded by a school of man-eating sharks. The only benefit we derived from the cow 
was amusement for Easter Sunday forenoon and one meal of fried shark. We baited the shark hook, a hook about ten inches long and a quarter of an inch thick, with about three feet of chain attached. As fast as we could put it overboard, we had hold of a shark. A tail block was made fast to the backstays, a rope rove through it, a running bowline slipped down over the hook and around the shark, and hand over hand we flopped them on deck. Oh, the superstition of an old shellback! It was the first time I had been in such close quarters with sharks, and with the others I enjoyed the fun of belaboring them with capstan bars and belaying pins until we thought them dead. The barbarism and superstition of sailors' hatred for sharks was cruelly manifested in this slaughter. Pieces of wood were pierced through the jaws of some, so that they could not open their mouths no more, and they were thrown over the side to have their misery prolonged. Others were cut open and cast overboard to suffer until death should end their fate. Many were cut to pieces and their backbones hung up to dry. These were afterwards polished to be used as walking sticks. The forenoon watch below remained on deck and joined in the sport till dinner time. Then, having had enough shark fishing, we threw the remaining lot of meat over, cleaned up the mess of blood and skins, and washed down the decks. We must have been out about two weeks when the small supply of salt beef and pork was all eaten. For days we had been beating against a strong easterly wind, but were now well to the eastward and northward of Bermuda, steering for the English Channel. From the day we threw the beef overboard, we had been on short allowance. The captain had promised to buy provisions from the first vessel we met. We had passed close to two steamers and a schooner, but he had made an excuse of holding on till we sighted Bermuda. Then he would signal for a tug to bring off some provisions. In some way the men knew we were far to the eastward of Bermuda. So all hands went aft and demanded the equal use of the canned roast beef and good hard bread which were kept for cabin use. The captain showed signs of fear. The mate and cook remained neutral, listening to our heated conversation. I do not know who struck the first blow, but everyone rushed for the captain as he and Mike rolled over on deck, clenched in each other's arms. A word from Mr. Moore, who had power to control us even with a look, released the captain from Mike's embrace. We gained this victory as it was agreed that we should have our share of the cabin beef and biscuits. The day's trouble did not end then, however. Late that afternoon we sighted a bark steering westward. As we drew near, she hoisted a Norwegian ensign. Without any warning, we jumped to the braces and threw the main yard aback, shouting to the captain to signal and buy some food. He threatened to log us all, and ordered the yards braced round again. I felt afraid. The captain had lectured me for being led into wrongdoing by the men, but what was I to do? I did what I considered right. I stood by the forward end where I belonged. Anyway, I was glad to do anything that would give us something to eat. In the strongest of sailor language, Mike told Joe Water that not another rope would be touched by any of us. Furthermore, he was given to understand that he would have to pay us for the food which was due us, and that he would be reported for not carrying side lights at night. Several nights we had passed close to vessels, and they had not seen us till we were very near. 
There was kerosene oil on board, but the captain was too stingy to use it. He would have the side lights put in their boxes ready for use in an emergency. He therefore risked the lives of several men to save a few gallons of oil. To save himself he yielded. We signaled the bark, lowered a boat, and the two ordinary seamen rowed the captain to the Norwegian, who had brought his vessel to the wind and was head-reaching, waiting for a boat to come alongside. No one knew what arrangement had been made, but soon the Norwegian filled away, and our boat returned well laden. A barrel of beef, a barrel of pork, two barrels of flour, a small sack of coffee beans, and a barrel of tar. We welcomed the provisions, but hated to see the tar. There had been very little work to do. Most ships, making a port of discharge, would be all day painting, cleaning, and making the ship respectable for entrance into harbor. With us there was no such work. There were no stores, hardly enough old rope yarns to make a roving for the head of a sail. We passed the watches, trimming the yards, a spell at the pumps, a trick at the wheel, and a lookout at night, and we had a very easy time. The sea lawyers forward were too many for the captain. Though fear of our demanding money for the food do us, or for some reason unknown to us, he gave us full and plenty. The troubles of that day, however, had not yet ended. Frank, Moses, and I, with the mate, made up the port watch. It was our watch below from eight to twelve that night. We had hardly gone to our bunks when we were called to get on deck and reef the topsails. The wind had hauled due east and was blowing a heavy gale. The light sails were hauled down and clewed up, and away we went to stow the topgallant sails before we began to reef. On reaching the four topgallant cross trees, I saw that Frank had taken the lee topgallant yard arm. As I lifted myself into the weather foot rope, I heard a scream, and looking abaft, the topgallant mast saw Frank falling to the deck. I quickly made my way below and found Mr. Moore weeping over the bruised and bleeding body of our dead shipmate. With the help of the cook, we carried it to the cabin and hastened on deck to help get the canvas off our ship. It was midnight when the old hulk was hove to under reef's topsails. It makes no difference how much a man is liked or hated on board a ship. When death comes, all wrongs and grievances are forgotten. A gloom is cast over all. Frank had been well liked, and every soul on board was disturbed and grieved. It had been only a few days since we had begun to feel safe in the forecastle, and now we discovered a half-crushed, dead scorpion between the folds of Frank's shirts. Meeting cooler weather, we had moved into the forecastle thinking the scorpions were all dead. Frank had hurried on deck, and leaning against the yard, trying to gather up the sail, his body had pressed the scorpion against the yard. It turned its tail and stung him, and with pain and fright he fell to the deck. This was the verdict on finding the scorpion. Frank's body was too bruised to find the mark of a sting, and it may have been heart failure. At all events, we were on the watch for the logwood pests the rest of our voyage. The next morning, the body was brought on deck, sewn in a tarpaulin, with some old stove grates at the feet, and while we stood with caps raised, the captain read, from a testament. Then, to the roaring waves of the Atlantic, we committed the body of our shipmate. 
His clothes were taken aft and stowed in the lazarette. Bill kept his bed. If I had been strong enough to contend with the Irishman for Frank's donkey's breakfast, I should have done so. I had been sleeping on the top of the forward house, and this lump of straw on the bunk boards would have made me a luxurious couch. I had been told I was a cheeky boy, and had had several scuffles with Moses about his cleaning the forecastle and bringing the food from the galley. He had whipped me more than once, but now I was able to hold my own and he had to do his share of cleaning. Bill was in the starboard watch. I kept friendly with him, and in my watches below he allowed me to share Frank's bed with him during the rest of the voyage. End of chapter 7